Oh, we're live. We are live. So I get to introduce you for a change. It's so exciting. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody in Blaze Land and Robin Land, which is so often in the same place. Thank goodness. I'm Jenna Plum. <laughs> I am the co-founder and the CEO of Mighty Blaze, <laughs> and I'm here with Robin Call Hamanoff, who we all know as literature's fairy godmother, the litest yeah. lit godmother, um, the interviewer of the universe, the, <laughs> or, <laughs> the organizer of the Point Street reading series of reading with Robin. Like she has so many hats, but they all mean one thing. Like Robin is the best interviewer in the whole world. And I get to interview her today. So I get to turn the tables and Ooh. ask questions about Ooh. making the interviewer sausage. And so <laughs> as somebody who loves to ask nosy questions as an interviewer myself, I've really been so looking forward to this. And I'm, I am really looking forward to bringing people who have helped us get our blaze kindled um, oh. out on the screen so that we can meet the blazers who are so often behind the scenes and working on air and doing all of these tireless things. We see the tip of the iceberg, you work 24 seven. I literally think Robin does book interviews like in her sleep, <laughs> talks to sleep saying, well, how did you get the idea for this? And your hair is so cute. <laughs> Welcome, Robin. Welcome back to the Blaze, which you haven't seen since like 10 this morning. Oh, thank you, Jenna. I know we, we, I've definitely been looking forward to this for a long time and time has really sort of gotten the sense of standing still yet steaming, you know, full steam ahead. And I mean, think about the books that we have covered since the middle of March, if not we, including middle March. The wall and they fell on us they would squash us I mean it's it would, a lot thank god like so many good books to read always but especially now when we're all locked in our houses during COVID we need all of those good books and we have them and I feel like I, I can just I've moved around this house my studio what my studio office has moved many times so I, I think you about were you were in the basement oh part. I was in the basement I was in the dining room yeah, I, they keep moving me. I think I'm good here because this one's this is my office. But I was in I've been in many. I, this is my fifth location, I think. Wow. So, yeah. So I think about all the different books that we covered in the different places because that's how I sort of make sense of it. But it's been a lot of books, and I can't believe how much has happened on the Blaze since since March since he started it. So. No, I can't either, actually, if I think about it. But I see you trying to lead me down the garden path into talking about the blaze and interviewing me. I'm not. Oh, sure. you know what? It's so bad that I do that. I'm sorry. No, second nature because you interview so many people, <laughs> all the people. I, I have so many questions about all the things, like where do you even keep your books? And I'm so glad you're out of the basement now and you have a fireplace in your office and does it work? But before I get to all of my questions, I'm going to read your bio for readers who know your face love your face we all love the robin face Aww. so love your interview but you might not know who robin actually is outside of being like she's the one who's always interviewing the people always interviewing the literary people so i'm going to grab this from your own website i think it's so awesome so robin call has always been an avid reader which we know obviously she takes speed to read all the books whether it was getting copies of Judy Bloom novels from Mrs. DeLise as a child, which is so cute, I need to ask about that, or devouring Tom Parada as an adult, Robin is never without a book, just ask her kids, just ask us, like we see her <laughs> online all the time talking about books, she has all the books. Robin is also famously known as the book pusher, the fairy book mother, I call her the fairy That's godmother, you. So that it me. It me, I came up with that. And all around nice person, which I can also vouch for. Robin sent me, um, or rather sent my puppy, a tote bag that said Professor Aww. Harry on it, a little monogram for him. And oh, I tried to stuff him in it, but he was too big already. <laughs> Here are some other facts about Robin that you don't know that I think are so awesome. She wears sandals without socks in the winter. Why? Um, can we say every line of Legally Blonde from start to finish, which I would ask you to do because it would take up all of our time. Can Eve shop in Siberia? So you speak Russian? Da? Yes. That's my Russian. Despises mushrooms, having never actually knowingly eaten one. My brother is the same way. When he was little, he would say, I know a mushroom in this casserole. And I'd be like, no, it's not. It's an apple. Made the cutting room floor of the Sex in the City movie, which I is, live in, is basically my alternate reality is that movie. So I want to know which scene because I know them 
all and has been known to like shows that last one season because we all do. Um, perhaps more pertinently, Robin is also the founder of the highly regarded talk radio show Reading with Robin, which is now available on podcast. And that's how I came to know you, I think, because you kindly yes. invited me to Reading with Robin. And then I inserted myself more firmly into your life. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> <laughs> on the point series, the Cardigan Connection. Robin is also on the Road Show, the Rhode Island Show on oh, TV yeah. every month, providing her book. Like, when do you even find time to do all of this? Is is one of my questions. Um, actually, Point Street Reading Series is now called the Cardigan Connection, right. so you're not doing like 14 things at once. No, it's, it's way lighter. <laughs> okay, yeah, because you just you rename something. We exactly. see you still. <laughs> So I'm going to shut that now and just ask you some questions like here's one thing I wanted to know first and foremost when I was thinking about I get to interview Robin so great oh. why like why <laughs> why do you devote every waking moment when you have a lovely family your daughter Emily your son your husband David your dog Benji who we love why do you devote, devote every waking moment for free to writers and readers and being sort of a literary yenta. I am a literary yenta. I don't know. I'm sure somebody could analyze that. And it's it's interesting. When I start something, I just don't know any other way than full on. And that's, you know, when it started as the radio show, I had the radio show, some events, more events, you know, it just sort of kept building. And, you know, it is what I love to do. And I just interview the people I want to interview, read the books I want to read. And, and, it's taken on a life of its own, Jenna, actually, but it is a lot of time. And I do sort of look at that a little bit because, you know, <laughs> it's getting any younger, but it is pure passion. It is just, uh, uh, I'm always thinking about it. I wake up excited about new projects. I'm always in some way, and especially now because there is, um, you know, rejiggering of all the way the events are seen, uh, the, the relationships I have with publishing houses and their goal to get books out and all of this entertainment and and content and sort of I'm fascinated to see where this goes next so I'm not slowing down because I don't want to miss anything I don't like to miss anything Jenna I think that's the long so you know that you're always like you're the one who is you know like Robin can spill all the tea so if you ever want to know it, like you got, like send her some chocolates because yeah <laughs> Things. So I'm, I'm looking again at your bio, actually, because I'm so bad with dates. I just make them up. But okay. that's right. In 2002, since you hosted Reading with Robin, I feel like you've been doing this for like 40 years since you were like, you know, five years old. Oh, a baby. Yes. yes. <laughs> Long time. Right. When you first started out, did you back into it? How did it grow? I don't know if you do know the story, but maybe you do. Or I, I don't know, but I started out calling another radio show. I was a caller. And I mean, no, okay, this is what I came for here. Keep yeah, going. yeah. I was I was working with my sister a bit and the kids were in school and I was basically at my desk. I'm not sure what I was doing. <laughs> I was doing something with my sister. And I started listening to the radio really as company. I never really liked talk radio, static etc. But I got hooked on the show and I found the, the guest, the host very entertaining. And I started calling and I started calling the producer and eventually, not to eventually, the host, who, and we're still dear friends, said like, who is that? Because he would see the producer laughing. He's like, put the call, it's a talk show, put her on. And so I started, I started becoming a regular. I was Robin from Providence for a while and then started preparing and it was around the 2000 election and the hanging chat and and you know just so much material and started writing bits and and i would wake up in the morning early and and go through the papers and just whatever was hot in the news we had the big buddy cianci story here in rhode island I mean, there were a lot of amazing local stories and then of course a lot of national stuff and then i started coming into the radio station and after um I was the first, I guess, caller that wound up in the radio station. And then I got to fill in for the host. And while I was sitting in that chair, which was horrifying because I wasn't really prepared at all, <laughs> I should have had a guest in studio. 
um, pro tip if you're ever in that situation. And I had to prepare a show, very little notice. And then once I did it, I was like, I want my own show. So I pitched, I pitched a show and that, and that's kind of the short story. That was the reading with Robin show. Did it? Start yeah. Out? Yeah. That was, that was it. Yeah. I said it would no training for any of this. You just thought this is something I like to do. So I'm going to do it. Give me yeah, there, no. Yeah. There was, yeah, there was absolutely no, no training. And I, I said, you know, it, I, I knew it would be about books. Um, and I was thinking about this when I would call in and I was thinking, you know, who, who more interesting than to chat with than authors who are well-traveled, um, great eavesdropper, entertain, uh, droppers, entertaining and research. I mean, you know, I think authors are just the most fascinating people because of course, right? So- We sit in our chairs day after day playing with imaginary people, but that's a kinder view. Thank you, Robin. You're very well, it's, you know, it's all the slant. And I, so I pitched the idea and the radio station was like, you know, we think you're very entertaining. We'd love you to do a show, but books, do people read? And uh, I, the owner at College Hill Bookstore and I were friendly because I was always in the bookstore and I pitched the idea to him. I said, I, it'll be four chapters. The hour will be broken up into four chapters. That's all I kind of know. And I reached out to authors directly then. I was not back and forth with publishers. And then different authors would tell me of their friend, you know, Jen Weiner was one of my first guests. Tom Parada was a first guest, Augustine Burroughs. I mean, I, I just emailed these guys. Yeah. You cold emailed authors looking like at their websites and saying- Probably, Pro yeah. Jody Pico, um, yeah. Just emailed them. Well, Jody, I emailed. I think I might have. I don't know which stories I've told, but Jody, I emailed in because she she and I went to rival high schools, but I did not know her on Long Island. She, so my email to Jody was West rules, East sucks because she went to East Smithtown. <laughs> that was my <laughs> show. She and she she yeah she emailed me right back. I have the email still, and so. And then that sort of developed from there to get, you know, publishers getting in touch and, and that sort of thing. But that's really how Reading with Robin was born. It was pure passion, sharing books, and uh, nobody was doing that, I guess. I didn't, you know, I was asked, is, was there a floor plan? You know, like who else was doing, like, I didn't know of anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't um, trying to um, emulate, you know, it was just, I want to talk about books. So that's, that's what it was. I love that story. I did not know that story, actually. And it's born of passion, but also a chutzpah, I have to say. Oh, because totally. Yeah. Who writes, <laughs> to, who writes to Jen Weiner? I mean, I've been stalking Jody and Jen Weiner on Twitter. Or they're like, oh, it her again. I'm like, yeah. Oh, no. so great. I'm parachuting in. No, but it's true. <laughs> there are certain people who ask things and then get given the things because of their lovely personalities. Like our co-founder, Caroline Lovett does this. We say, oh yeah, Cheryl Strait. I mean, once I said to her as a joke, I would like to talk to Erica John for my birthday, which is in October. And Caroline's like, okay, Jenna, I'll get, I'll get Erica for you. And God bless her. She writes to Erica John. Erica John's yeah. like, oh, you and Caroline can do this thing where you open the doors and you walk through and I don't know how you do it because I can go to the same doors and be like let me the f in and people are like mm. no so maybe it's like I think it's a Robin factor it's like that it oh factor. you're so, so sweet when you at that first station I'm picturing it like Frasier which is a show that I was obsessed uh, with that I so loved loved Love, loved, right? so loved. Is it like that where you have like the big mic and the cool headphones and the console full of blinking buttons? Like a the thing? console, which I cannot tell you how many times I dumped my coffee in that console. And you're not supposed to bring coffee on the side of the console. And I loved the, co I miss the radio station. And now actually, what? Yeah, yeah, I am the worst because you just, you know, you're talking with your hands the next thing you know. And so my show was on at seven in the morning. So I would, 
I was up and out early. My first stop was of course coffee. And a lot of times, depending on the time of year, my guest and I would watch the sunrise together, which um, it was always Anne Hood and I always talked about watching the sunrise together. She was often, I guess, a January or February guest. But there were times when that show goes on live, you're live and I'd be like, oh shit, there's the coffee. And I'm trying to clean it before I like short circuit the board and they don't invite me back. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the producers on the other side of the plexiglass and you've got the headphones and the first radio station before they, they moved to like a more updated one, everything was very manual. So when it moved to the newer station and everything was like touch a button, it was easier, but I did not have any training. I was given one little lesson. And when I mean little lesson, I mean, a little, I was a producer actually before I started the show. I did go in and produce on Saturday mornings to learn how to run a board. Um, and that's when I read Jen Weiner's Good in Bed. And that's when I was plotting my own show. So. That's amazing. Was she your first author that you had on? You said she was your third. First. She was my third. Thir yeah. The first, first the first show I did, I had um, my cats from uh, the bookstore, from College Hill Bookstore. He was the manager. So I had him in. And it was just more of a generic call. And then the second one was Jan Brogan, who you know, I'm sure, Confidential Source. And um, she was doing a book on, and there was a talk show host in her book. I met her at Book Expo and she was like, I'm doing a show, I'm writing a book and there's a talk show host. And I'm like, I just started a talk show. So it was really kind of interesting. And then Jen was my third guest. Don't ask me about my fourth or fifth, because I don't know. <laughs> okay, who are your fourth fit? No, I'm just gonna I do I do actually have all of the sound somewhere. So oh that must be amazing. Do you have in the in your house? I imagine there is not just a room but a wing dedicated to all of the books, but there also must be like there is a Frasier episode when he gets uh, to a thousand shows and he has them all on cassette tape and one of the shows is missing and he goes crazy <laughs> trying to find the show and cannot rest until he finds a copy of his show. So do you have a room like that where everything is like neatly on cassettes or CD or is it all translated out of digital? Oh dear, I would love to have a digital. It's, I have a lot of cassettes, but I do have the CDs in the sleeves, but like Frasier, that would also drive me crazy. And there are some missing episodes because at one point after, once the radio station did go digital and we, they weren't really on, we didn't burn the CDs. I could have had the, the files, but I wasn't really thinking longevity, posterity, but I have some interviews that are just, uh, the one I did with Henry Winkler, um, the one I did with Gary David Goldberg, like the, there were there were shows that I taped, not lot, you know, they were taped ahead if, if the time didn't work for somebody, Kevin Nealon. I remember there were some really cool interviews that I did at off times. And so those were in the computer somewhere and um, only I know how funny they were. <laughs> <laughs> oh no yeah Steve well, Sharippa there were some really good ones I mean nobody thinks the fonts nobody thinks about how technology is going to change also like when I no. my first I was using floppy disks mm -hmm. oh my god the computer and so people say oh can you pull out this scene or that scene from that book so we can use it for promo or whatever I'm like no I don't even have the technology yeah. anymore to be able to plug my floppy disk into to pull out you know a, a missing scene or you know a first wow draft where like you just it's there it's on this object in my attic covered with dust but <laughs> I don't have any way to sort of you know play it without some specialty project so who is this yeah. scary person you interviewed like the person you were most knock kneed about talking to well that's that's really um knock kneed or do you not get not need at all? You're just like, I'm Robin. Can no, it's it's not that I'm no, it not in that way. I, I think one of the things is I feel like I'm when I'm prepared, so I don't get nervous. If I there were shows in the beginning where I was nervous just because it was so early and like you could not speak to me on a Friday. I spent all day preparing for my little, really what came out to 43 minute show that and I would have notes upon notes and then not use them. So I think being prepared made me not feel nervous. And because I picked my guests, you know, I suppose if somebody were producing the show and I didn't have any say over it, um, I'm sure that I, I, if I think back, there were probably some, they were always great and entertaining and connected. 
So I, I don't really remember. There was one guest that was horrible and I don't remember their name. Honestly, I don't, but it wasn't somebody I picked. I had a sponsor for the show and it was one time when I broke my own rule and it was a book I was, so, the book was like this big. I really don't remember the name. I, I blanked it out and it was, and I let him, this person interview this, her. And she was in studio. She must've been so nervous. So the sound was awful. And she sounded about a hundred and whatever years old. And I, like when we took the first break, I was like, everything okay? Want some water? Um, and then I remember hearing from people afterwards, they were like, Who, what happened? <laughs> so that was like one time in all those years that I let somebody else, it wasn't a book I was interested in. I was trying to do a nice thing, which I've long since stopped doing. And I went against my better judgment and I let this guy, it was a children's book um, imprint that I don't think is even around anymore. I was young then, Jenna, but I was like, she was just so nervous and she couldn't get out of her own way. And it was like, the dead air is deafening. And so that was the only, that was the only time I was ever in that studio nervous, like really nervous. Yeah, that's a dreadful thing. The dead air thing is really frightening to any producer, to any anybody who's on air ever. It's like, do anything, but you have to still <laughs> just keep going, um, just keep going. And, and that's the, well, first of all, your whole life is doing a good thing, but that story is kind of like the, you have to do the good thing your way so you feel comfortable with it as opposed to, you know, doing a favor for somebody yeah. like your whole career is a mitzvah for all of the authors and the oh. readers but you are doing it in a way that is professional and warm and welcoming because you you do your homework I think that's right. like a salient thing for an interviewer I see this like with my own people on the on the blaze now um the on-air hosts they prep like I don't yeah. prep half as much as they do but my Mondays are all about prepping for pub day Tuesdays and like kind of scheduling out the week but like if you see Mark Cecil the thoughtful bro doing it or Jenna yes. Payon they actually like Mark watches videos of the authors he's going to interview beforehand. Like Jenna has read all the books, like they read the bios, they would. So I am so impressed by them. And then I think, oh, I would do the same thing, you know, for a subject I didn't know anything about. Meanwhile, I just show up and whoever I interview, I've loved their books for like decades. So I just want to talk about the books and geek out. And that's like my, my prep. It's my but and that, but, and that is the passion. I'm so loving your interviews and the ones I'm crying because you can see you're just so excited. And that, that really is where it all stems from. And so the other thing too is it's not a book club chat. It's not AP English. So I feel like, I mean, I used to be so overprepared. I'm not, when I tell you, you couldn't talk to me on a Friday and I would stay up late. I still don't know what the heck I was doing. I really don't. I had read the book. I was excited to have the author on. You can only get in so much and really a good interviewer listens and then goes in another direction. So mm -hmm. you don't say, oh, that's fascinating. So, you know, it, it just doesn't go like that. And so I still really don't know what I was doing. In fact, one time I was interviewing Steve Almond for the candy book, the candy bar. Love. Love. Candy and freak. Candy, freak. candy Freak is the name candy of the book. Candy Freak. Yes, the Candy Freak. And yep. I had... I had these women who owned a candy shop. They were like my in-studio guests and Steve called and I had all of my notes and I forgot them at the house. And I would go to the radio station so early that I had time to, I probably didn't need the notes but I felt like I needed the notes. And I drove home in like a ridiculous amount of time and came back in, in equally, like I, I, I'm like, I gotta get caught and I'm gonna have to say, I have a show to do at seven o'clock and you please handle my ticket after the show <laughs> so I, and I made it back and forth and I remember doing the whole interview with him I did not look at one note it was all that was such a great book um so I, I think that you know when you prepare it's in your head even if you don't look at your notes so I think it depends on how you do your homework. I, I wanted to ask you how you got your interview training, but I trained as, a, as an interviewer for Survivors of the Shoah Foundation, interviewing Holocaust survivors. Right. And our process was very much like what you're describing. I sort of taught it to myself, but you could not go to a survivor's house and talk to them unprepared. Like we went to their house beforehand, a week before the interview to sit down and answer questions and get sort of a scope of people's histories. But I would go home research every topic the survivor had mentioned in that pre-interview, 
write out 10 pages of notes on a legal pad by hand, wow. memorize them all, and then go back to the survivor's house. But we were not allowed to have notes on camera. So that was my training was to prepare, memorize, and then do the interview. And you're so right. I think good interviewers chase whatever happens naturally in the interview, because no matter how prepared you are, the most interesting stuff is what happens when people go off the path that you have. Oh, seen. yes. Stand for them, right? So what is the... What is oh, your yeah. interviewing training? Did you have any training for this? I think you mentioned Yenta earlier in the conversation. <laughs> I'm fascinated yeah. by people and their stories. I think people are way more interesting than they think they are. And writers certainly are. And so maybe the only way, I mean, now with, with you know, there was no social media back in the day when we were on radio and you know it was you had to, in the it, old days, like yeah. It, did, like, it didn't even stream. I remember before. when it's what? Pre-Facebook? Like Pre oh, that? yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I was encouraged to join Facebook because it would be a helpful thing. And I resisted for a long time. I didn't join Facebook until 09. And then once I did, and the show was streaming live, then I had Facebook friends who would listen to it live. And I used to do the show and watch my Facebook and answer Facebook people and talk to guests at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was really crazy. I, and Emily would come to the state, my daughter, for those who don't know Emily, would come on Saturday mornings. She's like, I can't, how are you doing that? I'm like, that's why I was always can hear you guys. Like you, you multitask, you can hear three conversations at once, but that's, um, yeah, that was way before. So now I will look at somebody's social media and get a sense of, of what they're doing to work that into an interview because it's interesting to me. Um, but yeah, no training. None. That's amazing. You trained yourself basically over the intervening like 18 years of trial and error. Was there ever anything, like any mistake that you had made with an interview that you wish you could grab back out of the microphone? I, I think, yeah, mostly probably when a technical thing would happen that was beyond my control. So it was frustrating because um, what can you do? And you know that people who are listening are thinking what's happening and you can't let them know because there's no sound, you know, that kind of thing. One time there was a hot mic, but I didn't say anything, but I realized it was hot. And so it was probably just regular chit chat for a commercial. But I remember saying to my producer, oh my God, could you hear me? And she was like, you didn't say anything. <laughs> it's not that interesting, don't worry. But I was always so aware of a mic being live because we've all heard those stories. Um, but no, I, you know, maybe I'm forgetting some of it. And I, and I, I do probably, I, I would like to like probably put them and digitize them and, and do something with them. But I probably would be horrified to hear what they sounded like. It's it's, uh, you know, you want to get better, you know, so to listen to the sounds, breathing was something I had to learn. In fact, um, now I'll get in trouble. Well, she's probably not watching, but I used to come home to critiques um, from one of my children who would grade my performance. And I have those, they're hilarious. And oh also they were dead on correct. My breathing was, I was nervous. So, you know, learning how to breathe, but I don't know, you just get less nervous and you breathe, but like hearing that um, anxious, I don't know when you interview people on the blaze, have you heard that? Like, cause not everybody's as comfortable. I, I think that's a great question, of course, since it's you asking the question. <laughs> I, I don't hear people, I can hear the nerves because I know the people fairly well. So, and most of the people who are interviewing on the blaze have professional interview experience. That's why they're front of house and the rest of us sit in back of house being like, <laughs> you know, we're going to do this, <laughs> and do this. But, um, you know, nobody is breathing like Darth Vader, you know, <laughs> I mean, at most you might hear people speaking a little bit more quickly than they normally would. And right. something that I often forget whether I'm doing public speaking or interviewing people is that it takes a little while to settle into the rhythm of an interview and at first people are like hi I am I'm dead well, I'm here. I, I mean I think that if I were to look back in I'm sure utter and abject horror at some of the interviews I've done on the Fridays these are like authors who I've worshipped for you know decades like Pam Houston and Anna Quinlan and I was nervous simply because I thought I just love these people they've had such a great significance in my life as a single 
entity sitting on my couch, reading a book, having these words sink into me and changing how I think and act. You know, Elizabeth Berg is another. That's a great Keith Christensen. Like just amazing women and and authors. And I'm sure that for the first five minutes, I sounded like you know 33 record being played at 45 <laughs> RPM. And yes, I'm very old. I still talk about records, but I, I think yeah. that's mostly it. like I don't you know I don't hear a lot of mistakes. I think. Tell me if you think this to be true. I have overprepared for my Friday interviews in some ways, handwriting out my questions, like in the olden days, you know, oh, I yeah. it was on my iPad and you know, write it all down. But I have found the writers to be so gracious and generous and warm yes. so that saying ridiculous shit at the end of the interview, like lightning round, tell us about the Pulitzer, Oprah, and your movie deal. <laughs> Whoa, in 30 seconds. We've been on for, I mean, <laughs> find this to be true mostly that the yes. writers are you know, so, so yes so open and so appreciative of the airtime and humble interesting and um you know just like we all are people with stories and you know they don't always realize and you know you I mean you know how many people of course if I say Jenna, oh my God, Jenna, you know, so it's that same, you know, it's all relative, of course. People are like, how is Jenna? Oh my God, Jenna, you know, because look at, how your, look at what your books mean to people. So I think, you know, really people in general, I don't get that. I mean, there are some people that would be really cool to me that maybe I would be a little nervous. I think maybe, I don't know. Like who, like who, like who, like who, like who, like who. Is that a song? Is that the who song? Like who song by Jenna Blum? Well, certainly, I mean, I mean, Oprah for sure, because she was, I mean, the joke about my show was that when she stopped her book club in 02 is when I got the idea to do the show. And so I, I wrote an article called With or Without Oprah because I, I never did anything with the article. That's where all my articles are. I wrote it, but it was, it was her book club. Then she, you know, I for a while stopped it. Then she came back with the classics, you know, so they were, but I read so many of the books that she picked and I was like, clearly we have both have great taste. And I was supposed to go to the show. I forget when her show ended, but I had bid on this um, package for charity, it was fall of 10, that's when it was. And something happened and I couldn't go. And they were trying to rearrange another date but she was ending her show. So there was no other time. And I was like, but I'm supposed to meet her. Oh, no, I never have, Oprah, if you're watching, cause I know Oprah is watching right now. Absolutely she like, does. Please come and get call Robin. Right. Ah. It was a great, it was a, it was a great charity, but it was, uh, you know, it wasn't to be, but I, uh, you know, that would have been, you know, just because you could feel that genuine passion of hers for books. And so I was so admired that, and you know, grew up watching that show uh, for all those years. So that was like unfortunate timing, but sometimes things happen and take precedence and lifelong dreams are squashed and we go on, we persevere. No, she's still... <laughs> She's still around, you can still meet her, Robin. Okay, so everybody out there in reader land, <laughs> you, are, you know Oprah, you have an in. I mean, honestly, we're all trying to get to Oprah. For years, I would go to people's houses and for book clubs and mm -hmm. say, anybody here knows Oprah or anybody <laughs> on the show can flip her a copy of this book. Whoever gets me on Oprah, we'll all go to Chicago together and we'll go on a Mondo shopping spree on Michigan Avenue and it will oh. all be on me. And you know, all the book clubs were into it and I kept waiting for something to happen through like six degrees of separation. Right. But not yet. We should ask Cheryl. Let's ask Cheryl straight. Absolutely. Well, I think about all of the authors I've interviewed who were big picks through, you know, through so many years, um, Danny Shapiro and uh, Jackie Michard and um, Chris Bajali. I mean, there's so many, right? That were, I remember, remember that People magazine article about the, it was like the first iteration of all the big books she picked and what it did to all the authors. Oh yeah, um, I, believe, I remember, yes. Cause I'm like, um, excuse me, somebody missing from the lineup, it me. I also and, want to be in that lineup. And that would have been a great pick for her, those who save. I mean, absolutely, you know? And I, I think, I mean, absolutely. And I think she could do like a, a peek back at books, books she missed that she should have picked. 
But that was, I, I feel, and I don't know this for a fact, but I feel like, you know, obviously she's a big reader and I feel like there was more of an organic feel too. She'd pick up a book, like when Gary David Goldberg did um, uh, the, uh, Must Love Dogs, when he put that movie together, he read the book, he loved the book, he met Claire, you know, Claire Cook, that was that whole thing. It wasn't all of this pitching of when books are coming out and now they're already screenplays and they're already sold and, and that's all great, but it was more of an organic, procedure and so we know how much all of these people are pitched these books so it isn't quite the same still awesome obviously but I loved when it was you know just pure passion as much as I think that that's the way it went I don't know I don't know I said I kind of have that suspicion and I actually prefer that I prefer when a book is a reader created phenomenon or if it, Oprah picks it up it's because she was browsing somewhere in a, in yeah. a Barnes and Noble Thing I have remember in the olden days when we could go to bookstores or an indie bookstore, you know, oh, like yeah. or um, you know, an unlikely story. Like so, Oprah goes to one of these stores and it's just like in yeah. you know with her big glasses, sunglasses on for privacy, just browsing the books. <laughs> I kind of I, I love that because that's how I discover most of my books. Do you ever get to read for pleasure outside of the show? Yes, because well, I mean, to the answer to that question is the the books I pick. There are some exceptions if I really feel like I want to have somebody on and there's a reason because every every answer obviously has a caveat, but I pick the books that I'm really excited to read and those are the ones I pick to do mm -hmm. so that I'm reading because the whole thing is pleasure mobile, right? So, mm -hmm. and if I ever probably picked a book that I didn't have slated to either do on my Instagram live or on A Mighty Blaze or on Reading with Robin and I love the book, well, then I'm going to fit a place in for it because I have to talk about it, right? So, it's a really tricky thing with that. Um, but, you know, there, there were times when I wasn't doing as much. And I would say, you know, that's why this started is because I just want to read, but then I can't help myself. So I guess the answer really is it, it's, it goes hand in hand. I love the book. So then I find a place for it. Uh, but there are definitely books that I say yes to for other reasons before I've read them. And I just know that I'm going to like them or publicists that I work with and know my taste. Um, and it seems like it's a pretty sure thing. So, you know, and it, and it usually does work out that way. Like you say, the sauce or whatever the secret sauce is. I don't know. It's a secret. It's a secret. It's you're attracting the books that you want to read. Do you get pitched all the time, like day and night? Do you have publicists banging down your door in Rhode Island saying you have to read this, you have to read <laughs> I, I, I get a lot of pitches. I get a lot of, even now, I mean, it's funny how some of the publishing houses can send, some can't send, some imprints, same house. It's very interesting um, how these how this is happening because I'm still getting a ton of galleys and a lot of finished books. So when some of them aren't able to send, I, I feel like there's a little bit of something, something going on with some of that, but I also get a lot of random uh, publicists and, you know, people also will pitch their books and, you know, as we do on the blaze, I mean, there needs to be some defining um, algorithm or something and also just sheer number, you know? So for every book I discuss, maybe 15 were pitched or 20, I don't, you know? And I try and find books homes, even other shows or book blogs, if it's something I think somebody else can use or do, I like to pass those along. But, you know, there's a lot of books. <laughs> There are a lot of books. There are, where do you keep them in your house? Do you keep all the books? Do you donate some of your books? I mean, I know you must keep some of the ones that you love that are signed. You work with so many authors on Point Street series, which is now Cardigan Connection, um, and organizing these fabulous big shows in Rhode Island that I've had the privilege of coming to. But you get like yeah. all the books old. Like that's how I think of my signed editions from authors. They are, yeah. I have the the signed the signed ones are in in the. Um, in my sunroom and they're on the shelves and even some of those I sometimes have to pare down and if I I mean the sign ones are hard to part with but I always find them homes there I actually posted on Facebook somebody asked about places to donate books aside from the obvious so I just put up a post and there was so much great information of places that were specifically collecting or whatever the genre and then people have asked I'm like just like go back on my page there are some really good information I always keep some in the trunk for the little free libraries in case I see one and I have some books in the car. 
And then there are the major places that are collecting them that I donate them to. I also bring them to, well, now I don't, but I did bring them to some of the nursing homes or you know the senior living places. But I also like the word around here is that I have books. So sometimes I leave them out, you know, people that are nearby and I leave them on the steps or whatever, but I always find homes for them in some way. And then there are a lot that I save. There are a lot in here with me. There are a lot in my room. There are a lot in the sun, <laughs> there's some downstairs. I mean, you know, there's some you just can't part with no matter what. I almost never part with books, to be honest. Like if I make it through reading a book and I have dog ear the bottom of a page, which signifies that I love a sentence, I write in the margins of my books. I only, read, I only read in paper. Do you, do you ever read on a screen? No, no, I don't. And that's become an issue with, you know, all of these neck alleys that come and I don't mean to be difficult, I mean, I know I am sometimes, I don't intend that, but it's not, and I understand that, you know, at some level when, if that ever changes, and I don't think it really will, but I don't find that satisfying at all. And it's enough with the screens. I really am holding out. And I, and I really love to read the galleys because those I don't mind bending and bruising. And I also do, I write in them. I put little stickies. I like to revisit passages and, I, you know, I've been known to say I move into a book and, and those I will not part with. Um, and they're, yeah, I move in. And there are a few people that I totally trust to return books that are important. And then there are some that just are not going anywhere. So yeah, I don't read on a screen and I know that I'm sorry, trees. And <laughs> just like, I just don't find it satisfying. I don't either. And I spend most of my life on a screen now. So when I yeah. read, I stand with a book, I usually like read and eat. And now I don't have time to like sit down and eat anymore. <laughs> so like again, like literally before this interview, um, I was um, doing something with one hand on like my iPad. And then on the, with the other hand, I was eating a piece of string cheese and like reading a book, like a print book, Caroline's with or without you in the gallery, oh, you know, oh, how it's great just, was that book? Can we so just say, I'm only, I'm only in the beginning stages oh. of it, but it's so great. It's so great. But I read I, it way, I read it way too fast. I, I gal, I just galloped along in that book. I really, you must be a fast reader. you must be a fast reader. You have to be. If I, your... if I love the book, I'm not particularly fast, but I do have endurance. So it probably seems faster because I will sit there for four or five hours and just read the book. So I do, I, I set up a lot of time like that. And that's, you know, what a book, like when I read, I've got Fiona's here. And when I demolished this book, it was two afternoons, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, three hours and then another two or three. Um, and, and that's, you know, I don't like to rush them, but like there are a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of books to read. So it's, it's an interesting trade-off. You know, you want to savor it, but you want to move along too and get the next one in. So. Um, but I just, I just really rather hold a book. And I know there are a lot of people will like last week with the electricity. And I was kidding around saying I can't read by candlelight. And so many people were like, well, my Kindle is backlit. And how come you and I'm like, I know. I'm yeah, just, but then if the hurricane comes, your Kindle goes bye bye, and you still have books that you can read with like a cigarette lighter. With a like, right, exactly. And you should see me in the morning when the sun was coming up because I was like at the window trying to, you know, just get the daylight. I actually, I actually did go outside because it was harder in the house. It was like 540 and I was like, you know, I just had to read, but yeah, a book is never gonna let you down that way. It's never gonna go out. You just need the light. <laughs> <laughs> no, and think how strong your arms are from carrying those books around all these years. Like so many people say to me, you know, when we used to fly places, they're like, I take a Kindle with me because I travel so much. And I was like, bitch, I've been to 63 events <laughs> in three months. And every time I am in an airport, one of my greatest joys is to go to an airport bookstore and discover uh. an author that I normally would not read, had not heard of, or had heard of whose books I hadn't gotten to. And then by the time I get on the plane, I have like five paperbacks in, you know, my back. Isn't that story. the best? That yes, is the best. Because, you know, because you do pack a wallop. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. No, I do. I you do. She's mighty and strong. And I think, yeah, one of my favorite things that I used to do, I've walked off the plane or and Penn Station or the train into Hudson Books or whatever, because 
I've said like, wow, you're finished with that. You must need another book. I've done it a few times, honestly. And it's so much fun. I'm like, let's go shopping together. You know, if I have a layover, like when we used to do that, but I loved, and also I love to, I've talked about this. I rearrange the books or put my friends front and center, or take a picture. Oh my God, I totally do that. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, oh my God, your book is here. Or like, I wait for somebody to go pick up a book and I'm like, I know them. It's a really good yeah. book. You should buy it. <laughs> You know, I've done so much hand selling and it's such a fun thing. And the new bookstore, I, I know, I don't know how new it is now, but at Logan, there was, it, there's, it's a beautiful bookstore. I don't remember what it is, but it's beautiful. And we were like, wow, this is here. I mean, it was obviously pre, I don't know what which the name of the- terminal? I'm trying to remember which terminal, because I know when you said Penn Station, I'm like, I know exactly which bookstore you're talking about. It's next to Zero's. Oh, yes, it is. My agent and, and, and my editor, I leave their their office half an hour early so I can go and browse in the bookstore uh. with my suitcase, knocking all the other books <laughs> off the shelf. And then I put them back on with my friend's books facing out. Exactly. You know, Oops, is. they all fell. Oh, I know. No. Sorry, that boring ass book is on the floor now that <laughs> run over by my suitcase wheels, but let me put Jay Courtney Sullivan up here. Uh, oh, right there. That's right. Oh, I know. That is one of the greatest stories. I remember um, Jason Diamond searching for John Hughes. We were in Chicago. We had a layover in Chicago and so excited to see that. And you can tell, you know, some of the books really stand out by color and you just kind of know and we're approaching it. We're like, I know what that book is. And yeah, it's, it's, it's uh yeah those are the like fun nerdy book things that that we do yeah the, the freaky like the the book ninja things like you are a fairy book mother but you're also like the, the <laughs> book ninja in the airports like facing everybody's books out i do the same and, and i think they, they like, charge for that right i mean you have to pay for like oh yeah also, spacing. When I worked in bookstores i worked at a at a borders back in the day before oh. i was not personally responsible for but yes absolutely <laughs> you pay for front table real estate and yeah Books facing out in the shelves, you don't pay for. That's a staff pick thing. But like, what books right. go on the front tables in a store? Absolutely. you And you height or whatever. I mean, remember the event we did at Grand Central? Oh, my yeah. God. Was that the... And that's so sad. That bookstore is not, right? That was in Posman's. But they're coming to Newberry Street in Boston. So Are I they? Oh, I, good. I, coming soon. But I love even the small chains, the small bookstore chains, Booklink at Logan. I go to... I have bookseller friends there who I see them every time I'm getting on a plane and I have no makeup on and look like <laughs> death face and they're like get out I'm like oh uh, there she like, is books. but I mean I love them and we talk you know all the books smack and um what people are recommending I always want to know what's selling you know so yes. I really miss that like I love being in the some of the things on the blaze I love knowing what's coming out now I'm sort of like following in your giant vibrant robin footsteps and I'm like oh I know that book because we had that person on the blaze a month ago and she was so lovely or he was so kind and you know what's coming down the pike at you but um man it's oh yeah a really cool thing but it's also so different from just being in a store and and kind of browsing that's the fun thing yeah and, and hand and the hand selling that the uh, booksellers are doing and you know, it, it's unbelievable to think, but it's possible that there are books that we do not know about and they're still coming out. So I think, you know, all the books, I might uh, not know all the books a little <laughs> bit my, that way, but I know some of them really well, but it, it, it does surprise me how much familiarity I've gained in six months. I thought I knew a lot being a writer, but like surprise, you know, and there's really more cool. and think about all the, what, Sorry. no, say think about all the books that were pushed because of the election and then changed. And then you know, and then the books that were coming out regardless. So like, it's very interesting what the fall looks like. The fall seems kind of crazy to me because here's the, the dish people that in September, it's usually huge months, like really big names come out in September, like the big literary heavy hitters will come out in September um, and, and then going all the way through to Christmas when they release all the big Christmas, you know, blockbusters, like that's when you're going up against like John Grisham or Ellen right. or, you know, whatever and like, but this year, people are like, oh, you don't want to pub in fall of 2020 because of the election. And right. people are going to be paying attention to that. And then COVID. And then so right. COVID, these big swells of writers out of the way all into one pub date, which is why August 4th was. Oh, like my God. That was insane. Designer. It was like the Queen Mary of pub dates where it was just this giant, like, <laughs> It was insane. 
insane. It was it was insane. I knew better that like May 5th was also like yes. that. And I- prepared for that I had publicists calling me in the morning being like where's my client's book and I'm like I'm sorry I don't get up at five I don't get up until nine <laughs> like now I got the blaze team and I was like guys guys we have to take crack before like if you don't take drugs yet get used to it I'll have to be on crack Y'all have to take seed we suffer get for our head. art we do yeah. suffer it's the um yeah, it's a, it's a, it's just such a selfless thing that we we do for the I, I stick with coffee for now. I'm not quite as ambitious as some of you other book folk. I see it. Yep. That's where yeah. I write. Coffee Send it and flying. Coffee takes my time, then it's the GNTs, you know, it's like this kind of the thing. So do you I have I have so many more questions? We're actually coming up on like an hour. So I know. I have are, are people like enough with them already? Are they still there? I have no idea. I don't know. Hi. I don't know. Hi. Hi what happens with me and Robin do you think you have discovered a writer like is there a writer who oh blossomed specifically because of you well you know it's hard to pinpoint but I, Anita Diamond was very thankful for my praise of and early approval on love of Red Tent and that was in 1997 and so no social media just big mouth stuff but I personally put that book into so many people's hands. And years ago, she did say, I mean, she was very appreciative of that. For sure, Jen Weiner here in Rhode Island, I mean, I hosted her, I mean, I had her on the show, but I hosted her in 04. And so like some of these, and Jody uh, Papico was here in 01, and I helped out a little bit with my sister's keeper. She would send me little instant uh, messages in the morning on uh, AOL, Met, whatever it was, the instant messenger thing. Because yes. she said it in Providence and she'd say, where could this accident happen? What school might have a crew, you know, team or whatever. So like we would go back. I saved those notes. I actually have transcripts of those because I just figured it would be fun to have at some point. So like some of those were early authors that, um, I mean, I think Sally Hepworth, because I hosted her a long time at the beginning and a lot of people here when we hosted her, she came here um, uh, two two springs ago, I think. Um, we were part of the big Australia tour. So, I mean, I, you know, who's to say, I don't know, but there are definitely people who will connect me in their mind to like, oh, I found out about that author. I love debut novelists. I mean, that is one of my favorite things to, you know, I don't discover them on my own. Someone's going to pitch them or another author will tell me about their friend who has a new book out. So I feel like, you know, I definitely like being on the beginning of that. And then, the authors I've known forever who have these amazing books that keep coming out. I love being part of that um, history, you know, of, of celebrating those books as they come out. So, but those are some of the books I felt very personally connected to at the time, you know, 20 some four years ago or whatever. Oh my God, is that 24 years ago? I remember when Jen Weiner's Good in Bed came out and I thought, this is just such an accessible- Ah, oh, loved it. Read. It's such a real character with real problems and and just like somebody's walking next to you, talking to you, like while you're having coffee. It's such great, like Susan Isaacs is a little bit uh, like that too. I know she yes. talks about, Jen has talked about Susan- Yes, her, they're her absolutely, her. yeah. Like Jody and Alice Hoffman have their thing. And, and Jen, when- I found out about Good in Bed through Jody Pico. They went to Princeton, I think, three years apart. And Jody said to me, This book just came out. You will love it. And that's how I met Jen via Jody. So, yeah, I love those it's stories. That is fine. Like the trajectory of watching people's careers. I've been thinking while you're we talking that, like, really, all of your stuff should be in like the Smithsonian, like the <laughs> JFK Presidential Library, because it is really a recording of years of. No, I mean, I'm not just, you know, I don't blow smoke. Like, I feel as though a lot of what you have recorded and captured in radio and in podcast and in person and, you know, with I am transcripts and like, I do, I have those. Can you believe it? Such a dork. It's history of literature in this country. No, it's not dorky. I mean, it's it's book geeky. I think, I think that's a great pitch for Oprah, Jenna. I think you just, it just rolled off your tongue like that. I love that. I'm a, I'm, I should have been an agent probably because I love to pitch people I love. You know? Oh, it's so, Jenna, you are, all the, you are all those things. You are so many things all rolled into one glorious package yeah. of bubbly happiness. I mean, there's, oh, yeah. there's, 
Absolutely. Anyone would take a meeting with you for sure. Um, absolutely. No, I, you know, Hello, you just Oprah. never know. Hello, Reese. Can you come over here right now? Because I have something to put. I'll keep working on that. Do you, like, in terms of trajectory, do you look back at your own career doing this? Like, the, you know, 18 years but before that, was there ever, like, a moment where you thought, oh, this is a thing now. Like, I have made a thing. Like, I've made it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I have. And I think, really, it's, it's become crystallized for me different times um, in different time periods. But through these past bunch of months, I think after all these years, the most meaningful thing, and there have been many, they really have, are the emails that I've gotten from readers that have said, and I saved them also, you know, this is, this is, I mean, it's, it's a little bit much to say it's gotten them through. I don't, I don't pretend that that's a situation, but that it's brought joy or distraction or new books to read, or they've won books on the show. And it was like a welcome package. Like that is just I, and I said this to you in, in March, like, I feel like all of this was leading up to here's this platform. Now it's really more, it serves. Um, and that, you know, that always makes a person feel good if they're being productive in that way. So there've been a lot of really neat things and opportunities and places that I've been because of, you know, some of what I've done and, and who I've met, but it's all about the readers and the and putting readers together with authors. So to hear that from readers where they're like, oh, I don't wanna go back to where you're doing this at four o'clock, is it still live? Can I watch it like that? Is just, that gets, that, that gets my reader's heart. Yeah, that's gold, right? I bet you actually do get the emails because I get them too every once in a while. It's such a privilege, such an honor when people disclose, like a complete stranger will disclose on email, like your book yeah. helped me get through my chemo treatments or your book helped me get through, you know, that one of my family members is diagnosed with an illness or or just COVID, you know, you've helped the, yes. the feedback on the blaze. Sometimes in the comments, people will say, this is the only thing keeping me going in this time is that this book conversation. And yeah. the first I saw that and I still it still happens to me if I'm working the comment threads I cry because I just think oh my god I do this I feel like I'm playing alone in my apartment the way I do when I'm writing books and nobody can like see me you know but I'm like oh people can see this and it helps it those does. glimmers from readers are the most treasured thing and do you have one email that particularly stands out to you or one communication from a reader I, I, I really do have, I do save them. And I, I there was one that um, this reader's mother loved Adriana Trigiani so much, love, love, loved. And I think Adriana, who's always doing nice and huge and magnanimous things for readers. I, I've seen her in action, there's nothing like it. And she doesn't forget anything. And this woman, um, was just wanted to do something nice for her mother. So I knew that Adriana would put something together for me or you know, make sure there was an advanced copy. And she signed all these beautiful um, books. And I think there was an advanced copy. I think it might've been Kiss Carlo. I don't remember. And then like back, um, you know, back stock and signed them. And I sent this woman the package, you know, from Adriana, but she was just, you know, I mean, the, the, the email was just made me cry, you know, and it was such a, not a hard thing because I, I knew how to make that happen and it meant so much. And Adriana remembered who this person's mother was too, on top of that. Like, you know, yeah. So like some of those things, but this one, I can't remember her name, but I have her email. <laughs> so yeah. And I, and, I, and I have sent books to people where they're like, oh, I can't come to this or they tell me what's going on. And I just will send like surprise packages to people when it was easier to get to the post office, but because I have all of these, you know, the backstop that people will send me and I've made little get, you know, and so some of those messages um, where they're just not expecting something and I can do that, that, you know, those messages are, you know, that's when I go like, okay, this is good. I like this. This is spreading goodness in the world. I think the writing community tends to be like that. I have sent things to people surprise things to people just because I have the luxury of being able to do that the privilege of knowing authors whose books I love that I can send to readers so I know love those yeah. authors um and I know about your surprise gifts because I got one because my puppy got one <laughs> where is that up. puppy where is he oh he upstairs in the kennel he he has to go kennel up because he likes he has cow knuckles that he likes to drop on the floor during interviews oh, and it sounds wow. like 
a giant is, you know, putting a sledgehammer down in the kitchen. So I, I finally decided, like, no, no. That little no, no. baby face, that little sweet boy. Oh my God. He's working, you. He working you, honey. He a big dog now. He comes out of his kennel in the morning. We're like, what did you do with the puppy? Did you eat the puppy? And he's like, yes, I <laughs> ate him. He is gone. I am now a big dog. I am a big dog now. It goes way too fast. Does he still have puppy breath or is that done? No, when he lost all of his little piranha teeth and got oh, like, adult wolf teeth, now he has like <laughs> normal, you know, dog breath, which actually smells like nothing, like air. But I mean, no, he's he's getting big. But you will meet him before long, and we'll do another show. I look I just, forward I'm gonna, to that. I know. I can't wait. I'm just going to come walk on the beach with you and, and Benji and, and bring Aww. Henry, to, Henry the Beast. Henry Absolutely. The, um, <laughs> down to the Benny then, loves like, Benny <laughs> loves puppies too. He loves puppies. You will so. not, Henry would be like, I mean, Henry, I've been calling, his name is Henry Higgins. I've been calling him Professor Huck because <laughs> he's like a redneck dog. Like he's like, I, I eat all the dead things. I'm like, you know. Oh, right. He's he like very British, but you're eating a dead <laughs> dog. It's not, it's not a thing. So if you have one message for your readers and then I have to let you go so that we can dish nasty things behind the scenes. But um, if you have one message for all of your beloved readers and fans who are watching, which they all are because everybody loves you, but what would your message be to your viewers and readers? I mean, it just, it seems so obvious, you know, to keep reading and sharing the books that you love with each other. And that's, and all of these wonderful author sites and pages where we share books. And I would say it's like sharing a great book. So other places that bookish folk hang, it just elevates everybody. And it just, I mean, I am so energized to see so many people loving their books. And the more you read, I mean, reading is essential. Reading, you know, readers are leaders. It's so important. And to, you know, sometimes pick something that you maybe wouldn't have normally picked up. You might surprise yourself with something, you know, really unexpected and dazzling. So that's, that's what I would say. And Jenna, thank you so much. I can't believe we made it. Here we are in August. <laughs> Yeah, we made it through August 4th and we're just going to keep on going. We will be here during the election, even if we're broadcasting from like oh a Oh my God. In the basement. Did you see this book? Speaking of this one, I, I interviewed um, Bridget today. It's a hundred years of, um, of women oh voting. I mean, this, this book is. I love it. Oh, I love the illustration. That's fantastic. I know my friend Michelle Martin, if she's watching, is salivating over. Oh my God, love it. I mean, right? It's 100 years, how US women won suffrage. So it's 100 years and 100 women artists. And I interviewed her at four o'clock, but, and we were on when we said, you know, if Joe Biden makes his announcement, somebody pop on. So we were chatting about Kamala Harris while that happened. Oh, wait, did that happen? Oh, oh yeah, Kamala. Kamala. You didn't, I, I figured you knew. Yes, uh, Kamala. I was, Kamala. I was on the blaze. <laughs> yes, so oh my God. I buried the lead, Jenna. Oh yeah, no, I figured you knew. I'm like, that's old news from like 415 or something. <laughs> okay, no, I have the news turned off on my phone. I'm on sorry. Tuesday. I would have brought that up no, sooner. I'm so happy. Like you make everybody happy and now you make me extra happy because and she's in this book too. I mean, she's on in chapter 19. So it was yeah, that makes me so happy. very Thank cool. You. Well, what a great way to end, end our chit chat. Uh, I'm telling you, Robin brings happiness to everybody. So everybody is watching. <laughs> I know you're here because you love Robin, but keep watching, reading with Robin every single day of the year, no matter what. We'll be in our bunker string <laughs> election. We will oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll be here. Oh, yeah. Kisses and Marsha Shana are doing all the things. Um, and don't forget to check out the Cardigan Connection and also watch Thank her you. on the Road Show and visit her on the blaze like robin is ubiquitous but you know <laughs> seek her out give her some love keep giving her all the big love and authors thank don't you. forget to send her your books and just thank you for being you and, and bringing all the joy i love you so much. i love you jenna thank you so much this is so fun oh i have the control so i have to like, i will bye, bye guys bye. see you soon all right so